answer the way that comes out of your mouth. Whatever's most comfortable. <laughs> oh God, are you sure you're going to ask me to do that? <laughs> <laughs> you do have a bleep button, right? Hi everyone, I'm Amy Devers. And I'm Jamie Derringer. And this is Clever. Clever is a podcast in which we have conversations with the super smart people who are shaping the world around us through design. And today we're talking to interdisciplinary designer Joe Doucet. But before we get into that fascinating conversation that I know you guys are going to love, since this is our first episode, we want to tell you a little bit more about who we are, what Clever is, and why we're doing this. So I'm Jamie, the founder and editor of modern design magazine, designmilk.com. And I'm Amy, a designer, maker, and TV personality. Jamie and I know each other from the modern design world. In fact, we both live in California, but we actually met in New York City at ICFF several years ago. If you haven't heard of ICFF, it stands for International Contemporary Furniture Fair. It's the main trade show for modern design in the U.S. and the tentpole event for New York Design Week. You'll hear us refer to that a lot. Yeah, and we kept running into each other at various design events, and it wasn't long before a friendship was formed, and then soon after, a business relationship. Yeah, we're both involved in design media, right? So it really didn't take long for us to start brainstorming new media projects. And well, Clever is our first baby. It's a simple premise. It's based on the knowledge that design is universal and that everything, absolutely everything in the built world has been designed by humans. So we created Clever to showcase and celebrate those humans, designers, because we're convinced that having a window into the humanity behind the built world connects us all in a more meaningful way to the world around us. So yeah, that's us, and that's why we're doing this. But we're also doing this to have fun. So speaking of that, we should probably warn you about language. I don't think this episode's too bad, but since this is our first one and you're just getting to know us... Um, yeah. Well, sometimes we sound more like sailors than polite young ladies. Yeah. And we're definitely not going to edit our guest designer's language, We want to bring you a full-spectrum picture of them, not the buttoned-up, polished, talking points version you normally get in interviews. So yeah, consider yourself warned. Design's only about aesthetics. Yeah, no, that's just one piece of it. It's also about problem-solving and innovation. I'm really excited that Joe Doucet is our first guest because he totally encompasses just how multifaceted the term designer can be. He's a designer, but he's also an inventor, an entrepreneur, and a creative director. He's a multidisciplinary designer. His portfolio includes products, furniture, consumer electronics, corporate identities, jewelry, fashion, technology, children's toys, oh environments, gosh. and architecture. <laughs> and he's worked for clients like Bernhardt, BMW, Braun, Hugo Boss, Lexan, Moe and & Chandon, and Target. He's also got a slew of awards to his name, But most recently, he was nominated for a 2016 Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Product Design. And that's kind of a big deal. A huge deal. Yeah. And he's a Texas native, a graduate of Art Center College of Design, and runs his studio, Joe Doucet Partners, out of New York, where he lives with his wife and kids. His mantra is, everything communicates. So how about it, Jamie? Let's communicate with Joe Doucet. Let's do it. Hi. Hi, Amy and Jamie. How are you? Good. How are you? I am very well. You were born in Texas, correct? I was. I was born in Houston. Uh, my, my, I'm of Cajun descent. Uh, my family is from Louisiana. And my father was a construction worker. And at the time, Houston was the fastest growing city uh, in America. And so my father was there basically to build uh, buildings or do the iron work on them, uh, for example. So he relocated to Houston uh, with my mother, and that is where I was born. That's cool. So did you grow up watching these, you know, this enormous construction prob- process? Almost the opposite, actually. We moved uh, back to Louisiana, and then shortly after my parents' divorce, and I moved back with my mother to Texas. Uh, and we, I grew up in a very small town called Terrell, outside of Dallas, uh, about 30 miles. As a matter of fact, there's maybe a thousand people in the entire town. Uh, wow. And I grew up, uh, we had a little, uh, just a little bit of land. And, um, you know, I grew up running around in the woods and 
you know, my nearest uh, friend, I'd say, was about three or four miles away. Uh, so I had this sort of this, this space kind of to myself. Uh, yeah. Wow. It sounds like a little bit of a solitary childhood. It was just you and your mom and in, in a tiny town? Well, it was uh, myself and my mom and my sister, uh, yes, in a very tiny town. Uh, as a matter of fact, we didn't live in the town. We lived in the country. Uh, we were about seven miles from the town where the, uh, where the high school was. Um, so when I, say, grew up in a small town, I mean, there was uh, literally I had maybe two neighbors within three or four miles. Wow. It was, it was quite isolating, but in another way, I think, you know, I grew up with a sense of really just, you know, exploring myself. You know, I was spent a great deal of time alone, a uh, great deal of time, you know, making up stories and, you know, my own adventures and, you know, building things and, and you know, crafting basically a world around me. It was, it was isolating, but at the same time, you know, it, it, I'm the type of person who is almost most happy when I'm sitting alone. And how things are different with my children, obviously, I have to say, I have the, the most fun with them. But um, I'm, I'm, if, they were, if I, there was such a punishment when I was growing up uh, as a timeout, the same way I give my kids, <laughs> that would have been the biggest reward I could have gotten. Just go sit by yourself and, I don't know, think or draw. That so when you are by yourself and thinking and drawing and building, um, is that kind of what got you interested in, in design? You know, I mean, in the situation and circumstance where I grew up, uh, I'd never even heard of design, uh, almost until I went to college. Mm. Uh, I did things that were designed like and didn't really realize they were. For example, uh, when I was in high school, I used to do the set decorations for the plays or I would do the school T-shirts or I had an ability, a natural ability to draw well. Uh, and compose things well. So I was just asked to do all of these things that I, real, I didn't realize were actually uh, design. Uh, I had a jo- an after-school job at the only uh, printer in town, Anchor Printing, and where I used to help operate the press and do things like this. And we had some customers that would come in and ask for a logo for this new business uh, they were creating. They had no capabilities, and I just raised my hand and said, hey, I'll, if you have $100, I'll do a logo for you. Uh, and, you know, I really, I started to realize at a certain point that well, this is really enjoyable and I'm actually making a little money, you know, doing something that I love. Uh, and, and so that was really my, I just stumbled upon design, uh, you know, through the opportunities that just naturally arose. And so being naturally good at, at drawing and making logos, uh, is that what led you to pursue uh, studying graphic design at Art Center in L.A.? Well, it, yes, I, I think so, because, uh, you know, I uh, not really knowing a lot at the time. And, you know, when I moved to L.A., I decided I wanted to, you know, have, make this into a profession. Mm-hmm. So I did a little research and it seemed like unless I wanted to move to the East Coast and go to RISD, the best school for that was Art Center. Uh, you know, it's a terribly expensive school. And, you know, I, I had to figure out a way to make enough money to be able to pay for your terms in advance. Uh, so I worked a lot, uh, you know, again, finding clients wherever I could, uh, doing some design work so that I could make up enough money, take that money, pay for a term, go back, work, make more money, come back and pay for a term. So it took me a very long time to make it through Art Center, actually, about six years. Uh, but through that time, I had this sort of dual understanding of not only, you know, the academics around what what design means, but actually a very practical real world experience and how you can make a viable living doing this, uh, which gave me a bit of an advantage, uh, uh, I would say, over some of the uh, just having a purely uh, academic understanding of what design is. I have to understand the commercial reality very early on. Yeah, I'll say that's sort of the biggest hurdle of, I think, grads who come out of art school is they know a lot about theory and execution, but they don't know anything about client relations or deadlines or real world, you know, budget parameters and stuff like that. So Uh, it's kind of amazing you got that dual exposure. Well, it didn't feel amazing at the time. No, I'm sure it didn't. It felt quite (laughs) burdensome. Uh, But, you know, at the same time, I, I, you know, I've came out with the ability to really tackle a lot uh, at the same time. 
You know, I, I never felt the need to deep dive on one project uh, while I was doing that because design work didn't pay very much at the time, at least at someone at my skill level and uh, my level of experience. I would have to do four or five, six jobs simultaneously in my schoolwork, uh, which was an incredibly rigorous program. And I just, it, it was great training. It made me very, very fast and, and really gave me the ability to multitask, you know, very intense projects mm -hmm. uh, simultaneously. And that is something that has served me better than any, any other experience in my life. So, so after Art Center, six years at Art Center, going back and forth between L.A. and Texas or staying in L.A. consistently? Staying in L.A. consistently, but, you know, going back for family visits mm -hmm. uh, when, I could, when I could afford it. OK. And then uh, what happened after Art Center? Uh, well, uh, immediately after Art Center, I was recruited by the Arnell Group. I had a portfolio that was... Um, it was a bit atypical in the sense that I had fallen in love with product design while I was at uh, Art Center. I couldn't major in it. You had to pick one major and go all the way through. There was no multidisciplinary course that you could take at the time. Uh, but so I just explored it on my own. And I, my final project was creating a floating dirigible hotel uh, in, in, what, 99. Uh, and I did these big, beautiful models and did all the, you know, the collateral around it and the identity and what the space would be like and calculated the lift and the, the airflow and, and, you know, really came up with a robust business plan about how this would be viable. And I think it caught uh, Peter O'Neill's eye uh, in a way that I had this, you know, very different book coming out of Art Center than most, uh, which is one of the criticisms you have in most schools. All the work looks the same. And right. I think mine, mine did it. Uh, and he offered me sort of a dream job. I could come and work in his, his agency where they did architecture, where they did product design, where they did branding, where they did, um, you know, um, advertising, photography. And I could just float around and work on whatever I, I found interesting. And what a great experience for first job. It kind of ruined me after that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I was going to I was going to mention a, a personal story. I had um, such a delightful experience coming across a piece of yours. It was called Black Box, and I saw it in an art show in New York City during one of the design weeks. I think it was around 2011. But basically, just for our listeners, this was a small scale smartphone connected printer that prints out your text messages, your conversations um, on cash register receipt in duplicate. And I thought. You know, I, I recognize that it was a, a conceptual piece, but it was such um, such a beautiful acknowledgement of how our most sentimental and important conversations are kind of becoming a casualty of the tech movement. And I have to tell our listeners, this piece looked like it didn't look like a, a project or a student work. It looked like a manufactured, beautifully designed um, piece of technological equipment and I was so moved by it. It struck me in a really, really deep way. And I want to ask you, how is it that you can afford yourself the luxury of creating all this conceptual work? It can't be inexpensive, and it's got to take a lot of brain capacity. And I think that's wonderful. I just hope you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, no, uh, look, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, and, and thank you for, for actually noticing this piece. It's very innocuous. I mean, it, unless you actually read or understood the description, it would probably be an item you'd walk by and never glance at twice. Uh, and intentionally so. The design language on it was, was very much focused on what it did and not what it was. Um, uh, to answer the larger question, I... I, I basically create a program where every year I develop at least five or six purely conceptual projects that I do not consider about the commercial potential of. You know, I do this quite, um, it's just, it's training for myself to free myself up from this, 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 you know, world that I have, that, that I, you know, inhabit every day and really try to try to just open up and branch out and explore. I tend to put a theme around them and then I'll do an exhibit of, you know, let's say anywhere from five to 10 projects every year mm -hmm. um, based around that theme. And this was based around 
uh, one of those themes, and that was uh, the idea of me, an exhibit that I did at, um, at Milk Gallery uh, with my company at the time that I had founded called Bond. Uh, and this piece was it was it was interesting because, you know, I, I just took a different point of view about new. You know, everyone thinks that, you know, technology, is, it, it, it is amazingly liberating, but there are there are some things we we lose from it. Mm-hmm. And I can remember as a kid, my grandmother opening a box and showing me this correspondence between she and my grandfather during the war. And, you know, even though he was no longer around, you could piece together a relationship you know, you can build a story out of these artifacts that were left. And our communication now is so digitally driven, there are no physical artifacts. So I thought there must be a simple way of, of, of you know, of saving this information, you know, of being able to share it. And I happened to walk into a deli and I had to order something and the register printed out, you know, the receipt, the yellow copy, the white copy of digital information. A very simple device, something that costs, you know, about $50 to make. And I thought, oh, there's the answer. Like if you just create an interface where you plug in your phone and you can print off, you know, text to text messages to someone from the beginning of your relationship until now, you each get a copy. And you have a physical documentation of a relationship that uh, in the event of data loss would, would just completely be eviscerated. It was just a simple poetic gesture. It, it was never an object that I thought should be mass produced. Uh, it was more of a, it was more an object intended to create questions than to give answers. Yeah. Th- and that's how it affected me when I saw it. It was really, really effective. I kind of feel like you bring a lot of, um, like you were just talking about, you do a couple of conceptual uh, artistic pieces per year. Um, wh- where did that all come come from is is that from your childhood like you uh being alone because I was uh, an only child for a very long time and I remember kind of making up games and and just thinking a lot about the world and and things around me and and I don't know if you've experienced the same thing being alone a lot is that kind of where that comes from or I also um I read on Wikipedia that your mom was an artist it, it, maybe it comes from from her you know, I think it comes from a uh, just a, a deep curiosity uh, about things, and a deep curiosity also about you know what what does it mean for me to be a designer? What are these things that I do, and what are these things that I'm I'm putting out in the world with my name on it? And is this ideal? Is this is you know if this is the last thing I designed, uh, whatever I'm currently working on, am I happy with that? Uh, and I think that the answer is always, uh, you know, not enough. You're not there. there there's more that you have. Uh, and, and it's an exercise, creating these conceptual projects or exercises, you know, just like as if, you know, if you're doing cross training uh, at the mm-hmm. gym, you know, you, you do something different to strengthen the rest of you. And I find conceptual projects fantastic for that. Uh, if it were all I did, I think I would... There's a there's a bit of a narcissism to it, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, I get that. Uh, if I if I only expressed what's in my mind and felt the world should should you know should fall in love with these things, yeah, it's a bit narcissistic for me. I'm not uh, an, an an artist in that sense. Uh, however, I feel that if I didn't take the time, the energy, and the effort, and the the, the mental capacity to be able to do these projects, you know running and ongoing all the time, uh, it, you know, I would miss such an opportunity for, for growth. Um, yeah, that's an interesting analogy with the cross training. I mean, you, uh, I, I suppose you have to be a bit narcissistic um, in, in terms of, of being a designer. Um, well, I'm a designer. We like, all are, are narcissists. <laughs> yeah, you know? well, that's true. But it's, it's part of that brain training because you're the one who has to come up with the design. So it, in the time when you're not creating those designs, you still have to be actively mentally thinking about things. Um, so I think that's a great analogy. Yeah, you've got to keep your create your you've got to stay creatively juiced, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, I, absolutely. You know, I'm 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 not the most talented. You know, I'm not the brightest. I'm not the most savvy. Uh, I am one of the hardest working. 
You know, that's one of the things I have. And I put that work back on myself. I am uh, constantly about improving what I do, the quality of what I do, the, the clearness of the language that I use in design. And always, always obsessively looking towards uh, what's next. If you were a rock star, let's say, there would be a certain number of your products or projects that would be considered your greatest hits. And by greatest hits, I mean most commercially accessible and popular. I see, yes. Um, what do you think those would be for you? Well, I have to say, uh, in terms of response uh, to the work that I've put out there, um, and not in, in any type of ascending order, but as the order they come to me, uh, I did this uh, flat pack table um, called uh, WL01, uh, nicknamed Screwtop. And it had this giant assembly that was very visible uh, and, you know, a very you know, completely machined out of solid bronze. I mean, this table cost a fortune for me to make, but it was, it was meant as a, um, as thinking about the flat pack furniture at the time and how, you know, delivery and the supply chain has such an impact on the environment. And, and, you know, rather than, than, than take the idea of self-assembly and making it, uh, cheap, a cost saving device, you know, making people very well aware that this is something that has an impact uh, on the environment and around them. So I wanted to create this beautifully elegant, incredibly robust heirloom quality piece uh, that, um, you know, that, that, that would, would raise these questions in people's minds. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and it got a great deal of exposure, uh, both positive and negative. You know, I, I remember Fast Company writing, uh, I think their headline was, Take that IKEA twenty thousand dollar flat pack table, <laughs> and it was it was intentionally expensive because of the quality of materials. I had it made in Germany, by the way. Uh, it was incredibly expensive, um, and you know we we actually sold uh, quite a few. I sold it through a gallery, and I was very surprised. I'm like, who's pay twenty thousand dollars for a table? It's just a, it's a statement piece, but uh, you know, I mean, they're they're beautifully done. Uh, and, and, I think uh, hopefully they, they remain in people's lives and they're not sitting on the corner like an Ikea table would be. Right. Uh, but that, that piece surprised me. Uh, and I think it was, you know, sort of audacious. Uh, and that's possibly why. Another piece I did was these, um, these headphones, uh, one sense, I called it. Uh, and that was, a, a con that was on a conceptual line of thinking around time. That was one of these that I called on time. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, uh, you know, I, uh, one of the things is how do you slow down time? That was one of the intellections that I followed and pursued, uh, and that led to this project. And that really became, you know, about this, you know, creating a sense of complete immersion where you isolate yourself from all of your senses as many as possible. So I created this uh, set of noise canceling headphones that had a visor that blocked your face, um, and that you know you would just completely uh, sub submerge yourself in one. And, and, you know, in almost every sense away from me, you know, apart from you. Uh, and but in order to when you have these things on, you can't see or hear anyone. So I wanted to create a visual message that you are in, in, in intentionally isolating yourself and you don't want to be disturbed. So I put these uh, spikes all over the visor and did it a shock red, high gloss shock red. Uh, and, you know, it created a very striking visual, I think. Uh, it was very graphic in, in, its, uh, in its imaging. And this went everywhere. I mean, this went on Lady Gaga's site, too. Oh, you know, once wow. Things get on, once things get, it gets sort of in that world, they take their own, uh, their, their own life. And this, received, this was, you know, one of the, one of the had, had really the most wide distribution outside of, you know, design with a capital D of anything that I've done. <laughs> Cool. Okay. So part B of this question is if those are your greatest hits, what are the B sides that you privately consider to be your greatest successes as, as a designer? You know, they're, they're little things and hidden things. Um, for example, uh, I did a, um, I did a project uh, many years ago and it was a, uh, it started off as a, as making the most of a derelict space of a, of a, city block in New York. Uh, it was an open question posed to me by someone who thought they could, you know, I might want to, we might want to develop something here that's not just a building. What would you do? 
Uh, and so I naturally thought of green space, but I thought, you know, that the space should actually give something back to the city beyond just another park. You know, it should be a park plus something else. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, should, maybe it should generate its own energy. And that led me to uh, a deep study on, you know, what are our renewable sources of energy. And the only thing that seemed to make sense at the time that was there at the point of viability was, uh, was, was the wind turbines in the megawatt uh, region, all right? Massive wind turbines. Well, there are two problems with those. One is that they, uh, they have to be faced against prevailing wind, which means they operate at peak efficiency 30% of the time, okay. which is incredibly wasteful. Uh, and, and secondly, they're just ugly as hell. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is why people try to push them way out into the ocean. No one wants to look at them. So I thought, can we solve both of these problems at once? And this is where this uh, double-twined uh, sculptural wind turbine uh, that we, re we had to bring in a lot of engineering help on uh, came about. And it was, a, you know, a beautiful sculptural form that is far more efficient than any wind turbine currently uh, in place. Now, see, that's not the interesting part of it. But the interesting part of it is how uh, I solved for a wind for resistance in the spinning blades, and that was to incorporate wind. I mean, they uh, work, turbines generate their own electricity, uh -huh. so I incorporated magnetic levitation as opposed to mechanical ball bearings, uh, so that a, a child could spin this thing. And you know, magnetic levitation allows us to break at certain speeds, so you know you don't damage the piece. Secondly, I put the generator at the bottom, not at the top, so it could be serviced by someone walking into a room as opposed to getting these giant cranes out, and, you know, which seems insane to me. Yeah. So those two innovations are what was really important and impactful, and some of the patents for that were purchased and are making their way into helping, you know, create a new generation of wind turbines. That uh, is so, so exciting. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. So those types of things, it's, it's the, it are those little subtle things. You could look at the shape and the form and say, yes, okay, that's really interesting. But when you dig into problems and the further you dig in, you realize so many things just have only been considered on the surface. There are very simple things you can do to improve, you know, the, the, the environment, the quality of life and, and, you know, bring design up from this aesthetic pursuit to this, uh, you know, to, to, to something a profession worthy of existing. Mm. Yeah. Hot damn. That's a good quote. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you've made it clear that you work in so many disciplines. Um, I mean, how is it that your creative process is flexible enough to work in all those different disciplines? Is there anything constant that holds it all together? Is there a way of working that you apply to every project? Can you talk about that? Yes, I can. And the answer to that is yes and no. Um, I think the reason why uh, we're, we work across so many uh, different projects is that I have a, an almost uh, debilitating sense of curiosity uh, and almost a, a reckless sense of the, the ability that we can pull something off. I love getting into areas that I know absolutely nothing about. Because I think that's where innovation comes from. I think that when you become a deep expert, you have answers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and answers come from experience and an understanding of the way things are done. And that is not where innovation comes from. Uh, innovation comes from curiosity. It comes from tinkering. It comes from questioning what has come before and it comes from naivete to be honest mm -hmm. uh, and that is uh, and, and i'm full of full of the latter uh in most categories so uh you know we i love when an opportunity presents itself and uh i get frightened i am tense and nervous to say yes nothing like fear um, is a motivator because <laughs> Because I just, I realized I have no idea how to do this. No idea where to even start. And that's a wonderful place uh, to begin something. My education was in communication. So mm. I was trying to create ideas and, and make them intellectually defensible uh, and rationalize each and every decision. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, making, uh, arguing a point rather than creating, you know, a, a physical manifestation of something. 
So I never begin a project by sketching. A, I sketch like shit. <laughs> I mean, my just it's terrible. My sketches are there to communicate ideas to myself. Uh, but um, you know, I begin I, writing. Actually, I begin by writing out a sentence or two and trying to create a very clear understanding of what I want this product to do, what I want it to be, what I want people to feel, what I want people to think, um, who should it relate to. Uh -huh. And then you just use the tools of design to shape that. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not aesthetically driven. I'm not a stylist. Uh, it's sort of the way something looks is almost the last thing I develop. Uh, and again, it's all, it's all quite intentional. It's all quite about, you know, being clear. And that's, you know, and, and as a result, uh, you know, I'm, I'm often called a, a minimalist. My work is called being, in fact, you know, I'm not a minimalist, I'm just lazy. You, know, I just, <laughs> you, you just got done saying you were one of the hardest working I'm ones. I'm totally in the making a t-shirt of that. I'm not a minimalist. I'm just lazy. <laughs> yeah, well, what, I, what I mean by that is that, I, you know, I don't want to put all of the hard work and now trying to make this beautiful. I just want that. I want to be clear as possible and do as little work on my part and the user's part to understand what this thing is. So that's so, yes, it might come across as being minimal um, in its exterior, but I, I don't think so. And it's in, in the interior and in the concept and then what uh, what the object ultimately does. Mm -hmm. Well, clear communication is uh, so important and so hard <laughs> for some people. But it is incredibly difficult. Yeah. So I want to ask you, um, you know, you've been to design school. You've worked with many wonderful designers. I'm sure you've had um, people over the years give you advice about design. Um, what's the best advice anyone ever gave you? The best advice I've ever gotten is make sure you get paid 50% in advance. <laughs> <laughs> if someone's not going to pay you a deposit, they're not going to pay you. And I found that to be true. And if I were to give advice to anyone about design, it wouldn't be about aesthetics. It wouldn't be about, you know, trying to follow your passion. It would it would be about get a deposit. <laughs> I like that. And it's so true. It speaks so much to like what kind of client they're going to be and whether you're going to be able to sustain yourself as a designer. Absolutely. If you can't, uh, if you don't understand that design is a business. Uh, you should really look into doing something else uh, right. because it's the only people who succeed. And I've seen so many people fall by the wayside over the years who had such promising careers. And, you know, the, the, the longevity that comes is not from talent. It's not from experience. It's not from being incredibly charming with, you know, potential manufacturers. It's about having a very good business sense. Uh, and unless you get an understanding that you absolutely need to develop this and you're willing to put in the hard work. And it's very hard work to educate yourself on how all of this works. Um, you should really choose another career because it is a very difficult career to make a living at and, a, and, a, and much more so to do very well. Uh, and the people who do very well are very good business people. Good wisdom. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so you've mentioned a little bit about your fear and your naivete, but almost as though they're strengths. But there's got to be an Achilles heel or a weakness or an insecurity that you have to overcome regularly. Everybody's got them, professional or otherwise. What's yours and how have you learned to keep it in check? Oh, my God, I have my fear and my, 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 my Achilles heel or legion, really. Um, I, I'm, I'm very impatient uh, with things outside of my control. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to come across as being incredibly patient. And, you know, I have this, this phrase, be a duck on water, you know, where you're floating above the surface and your feet are paddling like mad underneath it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always try to pull that off as a, as a point of composure. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm incredibly impatient. I constantly uh, feel like an imposter. You know, I find myself in, in, you know, in certain situations where, you know, you're being celebrated for one reason or another. And I always feel like, well, you know, why me? There's, you know, I'm, I'm just goofing around most of the time. <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of, I have a, uh, you know, I, I, I try very hard. Uh, you know, there's so many talents 
the people out there who don't get a moment, you know, whose work is never seen or exposed and who, you know, these designers, designers, you know, the people that we respect and we admire. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, it seems kind of unfair sometimes, um, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, I have, I have a lot of, a lot of Achilles heels, actually. We should, we should, maybe we could conference in my wife. <laughs> yeah. Well, that leads me to the next question is what, what's your guilty pleasure? Is there a TV ah. show you watch? Is there a snack food that you have to be eating? Do you wear socks with sandals? I don't know. Maybe we should call yeah. your wife. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should. But, uh, you know, I have my, 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 my nanny and I both have this obsession over the walking dead. And, and, you know, the first thing I come home, we just sit and talk about it for like 20 minutes and it drives my wife nuts, <laughs> you know, and she's like, well, you do something, you know, much more, more deeply, uh, intellectual pursuit and, but walking dead, come on. It's amazing. But your deeply um, intellectual pursuit is what you do at work. You've got to have yes. some downtime. I'm telling you, maybe I should start fighting zombies at work and, and, <laughs> and watching, watching more PBS. Okay. You've mentioned a wife kids and a nanny what's your uh, off duty home life like uh you know i um i'm almost militaristic in my schedule i'm up at 55 uh 550 if i'm sleeping in uh i get a lot done before anyone's up uh you know i get the kids so i get them off to school uh i am at the office 815 i work uh, leave for a, an hour for the gym during the at, at 3 p.m. because it is the most efficient time. There's no one there. Uh, I come back. I get a couple more hours of work done. I'm home at exactly 6:30 to really leave the nanny uh, on most days. Uh, you know, I'm there with the kids. They go down eight. I tend to do a little bit of work from eight to nine. A little bit of thinking, writing. Uh, you know, spend a little time with my wife, and you know, and uh, in bed by 11. And it's like that every day. I never run an office. If, if people are still here working at 7, 7.30, uh, or if they ever come in a weekend, that's a failure on my part and a failure on their part to manage their time. Uh, so I, I think I believe strongly in work-life life balance. Uh, and I get angry when we have to work a weekend, uh, usually at myself. That means I plan something poorly. Oh, nobody should work weekends. <laughs> I almost never work weekends. Almost never. There are exceptions to everything, but as a policy, we do not work weekends. So uh, you are in the process of launching a new brand called Other. Yes. And you're launching it with Dean DeSimone, who uh, is from Tokyo Bike. That's correct. You want to talk a little bit about how that came about, what uh, sparked the idea, and how you met up with Dean. Sure, certainly. Um, this idea, I'll, I'll give you a brief synopsis of what Other is. Other is we're creating a product brand, and we are doing it as if it is a internet startup, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we are creating a line of homewares where I brought together literally the world's best designers uh, to create objects exclusively for us. And everything is made with the latest advances in technology, Uh, 3D printing steel, porcelain, 3D knitting, uh, on-demand textiles. Um, And the reason why we're doing that and the reason why we're using this technology is that it allows us to bring these products in the world with, with almost no environmental impact. In other words, we're made only when someone buys one. You know, we don't have to cut tooling in China and put ship 10,000 units on a, on a boat halfway around the world and sit in a warehouse and hope that someone buys them. These objects don't exist until you purchase them, which is and, and made in really the cleanest form of manufacture ever devised by man. Uh, so we felt that this would this is a really interesting use of these emerging technologies and really transformative to this industry, which is massive. Um, how this came about, I'll tell you, I was, um, I was working at Cutlery Set about three years ago. And like everyone, you know, I ordered 3D prints just to test the feel and the hand and size and scale. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a new material was out, 3D printing in steel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thought I'd give it a shot, you know. So I ordered this fork. 
Um, it was like two hundred and fifty dollars, <laughs> and it was really incredibly shitty. It was very low res and looked horrible. Uh, but it was a fork. I mean, you could use it. You could throw it in the dishwasher. You could use it. You, I still have it. Um, and it occurred to me uh, very clearly something that I had long suspected is that you know, in the future as a designer, you're either going to be a maker, which I have the utmost respect for, and we have several working with us on other, or you're going to be a creator of intellectual property. And the small level manufacturer is going to be eviscerated. It's either going to be craftsmen or robots. Uh, and since I'm not a craftsman, I opted to pioneer the robot. Hmm. That's so exciting. It's an ambitious project. I went out and raised venture capital to do this, and I brought in partners. The first uh, two, two partners that I should speak of, there's Dean DeSimone, uh, and as a co-founder and the CMO of the company. Uh, and I brought in Evan Klebitz, uh, who is also now a co-founder, and he is our head of product. And he works with the designers and the manufacturer to optimize these designs for, you know, being realized in the technologies that we're using. And we're a team now of, we're seven. Uh, we'll be launching May 11th. We're doing this launch at uh, the Sky Lounge at the New Museum. Uh, and we will be a uh, live uh, e comms platform developed by Gin Lane, uh, launching on the same day. And uh, honestly, we couldn't be more excited. This is, it, it is uh, one of the most fulfilling things uh, outside of my family that I've ever done. Wow. It sounds, yeah, it, it sounds amazing. <laughs> and we wish you the best of luck with that. Um, oh, I can't wait. I'm really looking forward to seeing the collection. Yes. Well, you should see our, our you know, what's coming out after as well. It's really uh, each and every week that launches, I think, are going to be, uh, you know, we're doing launch every two weeks. And, um, we have some very exciting designers doing things, which uh, just astound me. Okay, so for our listeners, as of May 11th, they can go to OTHR.com to find yes, this? Other, other yes, other.com, yes, OTHR. Okay, fantastic. So we thought it would be super fun to play with you a sort of silly game called Conceptual Invention. Are you game for something like this? You know, I will do my best. We're going to give you a problem, and we're going to give you a few key materials that you can work with, and you're going to sort of put that in the old databank there and turn it around and then give us a solution in the form of a Joe Doucet brand conceptual invention. Okay, do I have like three weeks? Or just... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a longtime married couple, and there's a, a lapse in their communication. They've stopped communicating, and their marriage is suffering. That's the problem. All right. Here are the materials you can work with. Bread okay. and or vitamins. And or vitamins. I like, I, I kind of like being forced to use both. Okay. And vitamins. Okay, so lack of communication. Okay, so the, the vitamins come in because they, they obviously want to show that they care about each other and their health and longevity and want to spend the rest of their life together. So every morning, each one takes a set amount of vitamins and pushes little messages into the piece of bread. They have to leave little notes to each other uh, and then eat these bitter vitamin pills. So it's kind of a beautiful symbology around marriage, the, the caring, the health, and, 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 and ever so slight bitterness every morning. <laughs> That's fantastic. That sounds pretty accurate. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Your next problem is a young urban professional male suffers from debilitating hypochondria. And your materials are beeswax and or a space heater. Okay. Hypochondria and beeswax. Okay. Um, I get it. Uh, so what we do is we take the beeswax and set it uh, in front of the space heater. Um, for, let's say, a good three, four weeks, the beeswax starts to, um, obviously, in this liquid form, it starts to congeal, it gets moldy, uh, it starts to degrade, and then he is then forced to eat it, and as a result, he gets very sick, so he is no longer a hypochondriac, he's actually sick. <laughs> 
I like where you went with that. It's a little diabolical. <laughs> it's a little dark. I just, I just went to solve the problem. Yeah. Very, yeah, no, you with, did. With great efficiency, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we know that you are looking forward to the launch of Other uh, May 11th. Is there Are there any other ventures or products or projects you have coming out that you want to plug before we take off? Uh, sure. During Design Week in May, I've designed the uh, an installation for Corian, a giant, uh, I think, 36-foot bar that'll be an Astro Place. So you can go have a, a drink. Also, the sake brand that I am um, one of the owners on will be serving there as well. That'll be up through Design, all of through Design Week. Design Week in New uh, York City. In New is, York City, yeah. yes. Um, as well as a very interesting uh, take on a... Um, on an expanding table for modern homes where you can, you know, when it's a few people or when it's many that has built in storage, a very novel solution, actually. I don't typically like to design furniture, but this was a great project. Um, in addition to that, uh, just finished actually, and we're about to launch in terms of press, uh, this new office type seating for uh, Scandiform, which is a, uh, a Swedish uh, design company. Uh, and it is um, going to be quite, uh, uh, you know, it's really rethinking what a new office could be. Uh, and it is, uh, has integrated lighting, integrated tables, and integrated power. Uh, and actually quite a beautiful, simple form that allows you to create your, your own space. Uh, and we are developed an app that's going to help you sleep better. Oh, my God. Ooh. That sounds cool. That sounds like, um, yeah, there's a lot going on in that brain of yours. Thank you so much for spilling it all out for us. Um, We want to make sure our listeners can find you. Uh, Can you tell us what your website and social media handles are? My website is www.jodusay.com. And actually on all my social media is just at Joe Dusay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing all that intel and wisdom and your personal stories. I feel like I know you well. I can't wait to see you um, at Design Week. All right. Fantastic. Okay, we'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Cheers. Bye. He's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that he um, makes himself do conceptual projects as part of his, like, sort of mental CrossFit. I know. It takes, it must take such discipline to do it, but he's absolutely right. That's how you keep your brain working. Mm -hmm. On off hours, just keep it creative and keep the juices flowing. And I also love that he keeps almost a military schedule and to maintain a life work balance, which is so important. It's so important. I, I can't, oh, I can't do the military schedule though. I, it takes such discipline and I'm so impressed. I, I don't know what it takes to do it, but I don't know. I can't do it and I, I would like to do it, but it just never seems to work out for me. Um, I also was really impressed by the, his, Thoughts on uh, curiosity being and naivete being the drivers of innovation. And I totally agree with that. I think yeah. one of the things that I've always resisted in my career is they try and call me a, an expert, like a, an ex, a lifestyle expert or a home improvement mm-hmm. expert. And I'm like, I don't know shit. I am just curious <laughs> about a lot of stuff. But I never felt comfortable with the term expert because it feels like a lock. And he's absolutely right. Like, it's having questions about things and not being an expert that leads you mm-hmm. to asking like the really obvious questions that the experts are overlooking because they're so mired in all the right. historical wisdom and documentation and studying they've been doing on the subject. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, you know, one of the things I say about artwork is I never went to art school, but I, I draw and paint for fun. But what I think is so great about never having painted with paints before and, and not going to school to learn how to properly mix paints and, and use paint brushes and all that stuff is that there's more room for experimentation. And, and when you're approaching a medium or something for the first time, there's this like sense of, of, of being a rookie that's actually useful in, in, the, in the creative process. Uh, because you really can't see like the end result and you can't really see the process. You're just going to go through it blindly. Yeah. And that makes things so much fresher, in my opinion. I, and then I think, but a, a 
part and parcel of that is that imposter feeling that he also talked about. Is like if you're going to feel like a rookie when you start, there's no way you're going to feel worthy of an award when somebody、mm. tries to recognize you for it. You're going to feel like、right. a fraud. Like, hey, I didn't know what I was doing when I started this, and you're giving、mm-hmm. me an award for it.、Um, but I think we all have to. I mean, I think imposter syndrome is something that everyone suffers from. That's not、Absolutely. unique to designers or or anything. Yeah,、um, I, I think so too. I think if we're going to embrace curiosity and naivete, then we have to learn to keep the imposter syndrome in check. That's what I take away from this. Well, we hope that you guys enjoyed our talk with Jody Say as much as we did. And if you like this, could you do us a huge favor and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts? Or、maybe? rate us on iTunes. Ooh, yeah, we need that rating. And、uh, if you want to find out more about Joe Dusay, we'll have a bunch of information and images and stuff in our show notes at cleverpodcast dot com. And be sure to follow us at, on Twitter at Clever Podcast. We're also on Facebook and Instagram. And where else are we, Amy? <laughs> we are all over the place. We need、We're、your、everywhere. support. Yeah. So subscribe, follow us on social media, sign up for our newsletter, and we want to give a shout out to Chris Modal of Your Studios. He edited this episode, and he's awesome. The music you heard was from L Ten Eleven. You can find more from them at their website, e l t e n e l e v e n dot com. And thanks to Jenny Rask for our branding, and mostly thanks to you guys. Thanks for listening.、Yes. Episode number、thanks、one in the can.、Woo. Jamie Derringer, high five! High five!